behalf of Sankar Global Summit in Delhi CAP, I welcome you all to Sankar Virtual 2020 and our session today, Taking Impact Investing Retail Opportunities and Challenges. We're delighted to have you all join us here in this exciting new format virtually. A few housekeeping rules from our side. I request everyone apart from the panelists to keep their videos and mics off, but please feel free to use the chat to share your comments, questions, etc. Uh, I'd also like to especially take this opportunity to thank our session partner, Baytree Ventures, for you know putting together this session with us. And I'll hand it over to you, Radha, to take this forward. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, Trina, and thank you, Team Sankal. This is always a massive endeavor, and the virtual format this year, I'm sure, posed many new challenges for you. So well done for getting it off the ground smoothly. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session on Taking Impact Investing Retail. As we all know, impact investing has witnessed an impressive growth in the last decade with over $700 billion in assets under management. And this past decade was focused on innovations involving both institutional and accredited investors or HNIs. We believe the next frontier for impact investing lies with retail investors. Mass retail, mass affluent retail investors are projected to have over 100 trillion in investing power globally. To put it in perspective, that's about 14 times the size of BlackRock. That is a huge opportunity waiting to be tapped. I'm looking forward to this exciting session and an insightful conversation with my distinguished panel today to unpack the opportunities and challenges that we can foresee in taking impact investing retail. Please join me in welcoming Damien Peatikis. Damien is the head of sustainable and impact investing at Barclays. Um, he's, he and his award-winning team at Barclays have been guiding individuals, family offices, charities, foundations on how to invest both to protect and to grow their assets to make a positive contribution to our world. Uh, they have, their interventions have been designed with both the public and the private market uh, in perspective. Damien also leads Barclays sponsorship of Impact Agora, a recently launched global institutional impact investing platform that facilitates deal sharing between fund managers, accelerators, family offices, foundations, and others. Damien, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, our next member on the panel today is Tom McGillicuddy. Tom is the co-founder of Ticker, which is an amazing, innovative new startup. It's an app designed to take impact investing to the next generation of investors. He's actually leading at the forefront about all the stuff that we're going to be talking about in the panel today. And we are really looking forward to hearing his early experiences and insights from being at the coal face. Before founding Ticker, Tom has been in investment management for about a decade. Uh, welcome, Tom. Our third member on the panel today is Ramesh Venkat. Ramesh is the founder of Fairwinds Asset Management, as well as, of course, being my co-founder at Patreon. Ramesh comes with an extensive background and experience in private equity, banking, and corporate finance in India. He spent, um, he wears many different hats, uh, you know, include an including an academic hat, but I'm hoping he's today going to share some perspectives with us uh, particularly on the state of the Indian financial markets, emerging markets more generally, and, and taking an impact investing lens over there. Thank you, Ramesh, for joining us, and welcome all of you. In terms of format, I thought I'll hand over to each of you to make some opening remarks, followed by a discussion between the panel members, and then we can open it up for a wider question and answer session with our audience. And then I'll circle back to each of you for a couple of minutes of wrap up. Does that sound okay? Uh, Damien, why don't uh, I invite you to go first? Thank you, Anu, and thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. My first song up, um, hopefully not my last, and uh, looking forward to eventually seeing everyone in person again. Uh, Barclays probably doesn't need much of an introduction for many of you, although perhaps a little bit more in terms of what we are doing in this space. Um, first, at a global level, sort of at a corporate level, you know, really exciting times for us. Uh, very clearly climate being a priority for the industry, financial services industry more generally, and really pleased that we made some commitments around being able to move and help transition to a lower carbon economy. I think all of us would like to be able to see that faster. We recognize the route around that 
but made some really nice commitments around a net zero goal on scope one, two, and three emissions, which is really interesting to be working with clients on that basis, as well as capital going into the space. But moreover, how we are dealing with clients, and that's certainly where my role in the work that we're doing comes in. So I sit within the private bank, so we tend to deal with our, our wealthier clients, individuals, families, and family offices, but actually across Barclays, really thinking about how investing we are working with those clients that both protect and grow their assets and make that positive contribution to the world. And that's something that we've been doing over the last sort of five to seven years. Um, it's definitely been a long journey and a, and a challenge, but just to share a little bit around what, uh, what the focus has been. You know, a lot of my time I spend talking with individual investors or families about what they want to do. We also do some really interesting research around that topic, and I'll refer back to it going forward. Some investing for global impact research we did with 300 of the largest families globally to see where their interests are. But actually, earlier on in the journey, thinking about our retail investors, we did some behavioral finance research, um, investing for uh, motivations around investing around behavioral finance and some really fascinating things coming out at that, that level also. So where we deal on an advisory basis with the clients, we deal with them on one way, but where we deal on an execution only basis, it's a different story. And so really understanding what some of those motivations are and seeing where that desire for positive change but also where the desire to generate returns comes in and understanding of how to do that. Secondly, as Anu said, we do work across the investment spectrum in terms of private markets and public markets, structured products, a full range of products, and really integrating impact and sustainability considerations into what we do. Um, and lastly, actually, I uh, really, really have a privilege, I think, given where we sit, to be involved in some of the wider initiatives and hopefully bring to light some of those as well. So I was involved in the advisory group to the UK government around the topic uh, and Elizabeth Corley's task force to be able to help to build out the UK market, um, as well as uh, what is now sort of the Impact Investing Institute, which actually brought in the UK National Advisory Board, bringing those together in the UK. Um, really some, some relevant ideas that came out of all of that work. And I think moreover, I think an indication for those of you who are interested in, in working in your particular countries to be able to highlight some of the efforts that, or recognition of some of the recommendations, recommendations, excuse me, that we made at the time, I think are still relevant for anyone, as well as for those of you who are internal to companies, a little bit of the entrepreneurship and the diligence and dedication you need to have to keep on going over the long-term time horizon. So hopefully a few things to be able to share as we go through today. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions in the chat as well. And uh, hopefully looking forward to a good conversation. Thank you for that, Damien. Thank you so much. Tom, I'll hand over to you to show us, you know, how you've translated some of that vision within the UK at a policy and government level into action. Well, thank you so much for uh, for having me. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here. Shame we can't be in person, as Damien said, but sometime soon, hopefully. Um, so I'll give you a bit of background on me, and then I'll I'll, I'll give you an overview of what Ticker is today and our, our, our customer base and what we're trying to uh, move towards in the future. Um, so I actually started my career at Barclays. Uh, Damien and I overlapped while I was there. And then I, I left in 2013 to join a US investment um, company called Wellington Management. Um, and it was there that I started working in impact investing. Um, but it was actively managed listed markets, equity impact investing. And we were investing money on the behalf of uh, pension funds and family offices. And uh, every year we were doing it, we were investing in these amazing companies around the world and we beat the market every single year um, by investing in these real like stories that you could tell to your parents why they're a good thing for the world and they'd understand. Um, and during that time, myself and the co-founder, other co-founder of Ticker, Matt Latham, we started to think, you know, wouldn't um, our friends and uh, of our generation in the industry really really want to do this with their own money if they could. At the time, this is like 2015, 16, it was really just institutions um, and wealthy individuals that had access to this, this way of investing. But we thought that if we put this in the hand, hands of millions of individuals, millions of people of our generation, 25 to 35, what could the impact of that be in terms of shifting consumer behavior and shifting consumer attitudes? Um, so we left uh, our jobs in 2018 and uh, started working on Ticker. And the, the basic idea of Ticker is to mobilize uh, a large volume of individuals to invest for the first time, but only investing in companies that are doing good stuff for the world. So the simplified user experience is, um, it's all app-based, uh, Android and Apple, and you download the app, sign up in about two minutes, and you select an impact theme that you care about the most, like climate change, uh, and then select a, a risk level, high, medium, and low that you're comfortable with. And you can start investing from just five pounds. And in the background, we've built 
uh, portfolios of companies and um, other securities linked to the theme that you've selected. Um, so the, the customer just selects the overarching theme and then we've done all the work for them. And then once they're in the app, they get some investment education um, and they get impact reporting and stories and narrative about all the good reasons for them to invest this way and all the good things the companies are doing in the background. Um, and the, the goal for us was to kind of acquire a demographic as a user base that had never been touched by the investment management industry before. And we've we've started to do that. We're, we're about, we're, we're not far off 100,000 customers in the UK only. Um, and the average customer is 31 years old, 50-50 in terms of gender split. 90% of them have never invested before. Um, and as of this month, they're investing about 220 pounds per month. Um, and the churn is very, very low. So they're treating this as, um, a long-term savings and investment product, and it's the first time they've ever done it, and they're doing it purely in impact and sustainable investments. Um, so that was the first kind of goal for us was to hit that and tick that box. Now, as a company, what we want to move to is what we've realized um, is that our generation are looking for many, many ways to have an impact, and investing is one of those areas, but we want to kind of improve the platform by offering uh, additional services um, that enable our customers to have more of, an, more of an impact every time they log into the app. So for example, as of last week, um, now we calculate our customers' carbon footprint for them, we coach them on ways to bring it down, and we offset it for them, um, the remaining carbon footprint. So for us, we want to we want to grow from beyond just investing to kind of total impact for our generation and get them to think about all the ways in which they can have an impact, investing being one of the key ways uh, to do it. Um, but yeah, so that was the, the original goal for us is to now um, go beyond the UK, expand into Europe, expand beyond that in the next few years and take what Ticker is today um, global eventually over the next three, four, five years. Thank you, Tom. It is a really exciting model and, and I'm sure you're, you're going to have a lot of questions from, from, from the yep. audience on it. Um, moving to you, Ramesh, um, uh, looking forward to hearing your perspective on how do you take this lens to a market like India? Uh, thank you, Anuradha. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, of course, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, of course, the last Sankalp, uh, I still remember the, the vibrancy we saw in person, and I hope we'll get back to that soon. But in the meantime, we make do with, with what's, what's best possible today. Uh, so, it's, it's great to be here uh, with, with this panel and uh, hope to bring uh, some perspective, some Indian and emerging market perspective to, to, to retail uh, in impact investing. Uh, of course, it's it's relatively early days for impact investing in India compared to some of the other markets in the world, especially compared to the European and possibly the US market. Uh, and like most other markets, the first wave or the initial stages of impact investing has been led by institutions. So we had the foreign institutions coming in first and uh, followed fairly quickly by a number of homegrown Indian institutions, which have become uh, reasonably formidable in their own right in the last few years. Um, Lately, we've also seen family offices uh, the, and the larger individual investors, the ultra high net worth and the high net worth individuals coming in into this market. Uh, some of the larger family offices in India have actually uh, developed, uh, I would say, a fairly mature uh, uh, policies for, for impact investing, uh, dedicating a, a, a team and uh, as well as a percentage of the portfolios for impact and so on. So, so therefore, therefore, actually making uh, good inroads into this market. Uh, but most interestingly, and which is which is what we I hope we'll be able to talk about in some detail today. We are also seeing a fair bit of inquiries from uh, professional and other uh, uh, what I would call high street retail investors. Uh, so, so this is a very interesting trend. In some ways, some ways it is it is it is quite understandable because India has always had a very active retail equity culture. Uh, it's it's one of those markets where uh, equity investments for a very long time, for for over I would say 25 to 30 years, has been driven by retail investors. Even today, the definition of retail from an equity or a capital market perspective is someone who invests uh, approximately rupees 200,000 rupees or or which is which is. Uh, uh, two thousand, little over two thousand five hundred dollars in an IPO, and this is a very very active market. Uh, as of today, it, it's uh, estimated that we've got over thirty million uh, direct equity investors in the market. Uh, so, so these are individuals who invest uh, not only in plain vanilla equities; uh, they, they trade in equities, but they also do options and derivatives and so on. 
uh, which which is which is which is quite a large number, and and these are not just uh, metropolitan or or tier one city investors. They are not from Mumbai and Delhi alone, but a whole lot of them. In fact, the vast majority of the new entrants uh, come from the tier two, tier three, and and even smaller places in India, with 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 broadband quite easily available and and extremely inexpensive in India. Uh, so we have day traders, and we have all kinds of uh, fairly sophisticated investors from all over India in the equity markets. Which we think will, at some stage, also extend to the to, to the impact area and so on. Uh, of course, you know one has to be rather careful given that uh, much of impact investing in India at this point is early stage and therefore relatively high risk. It's a relatively liquid market. It's also a longer maturity market, uh, all of which is not necessarily very conducive to retail. But on the other hand, uh, we have a number of enablers going for for uh, which, which which actually should. Uh, help development of this market. One, the, the tech backbone, the technology backbone in the capital markets in India is extremely robust. Uh, we have a very good technology backbone for deal processing, for payments, for data security, and so on. Uh, investor protection again is has has uh, come of age in India lately over the last few years, as is the regulatory environment. So, so there are there are a whole lot of positives which I think will enable uh, us to leapfrog. A generation and and get retail participation in the impact market sooner rather than later. In fact, I would think that it's it's probably going to overlap uh, the the uh, the HNI and the family office market, unlike the the sequential uh, evolution which we see in other markets. So I hope we can discuss some of these issues and challenges today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ramesh. That was very very insightful and probably a neat segue uh, into our um, opening up. Um, the panel for a discussion and you know picking up from Ramesh's point about H and I uh, and um, and the accredited investors uh, segment, Gimin, perhaps you could share with us a little bit. You know how your own journey has been in Barclays. You started nearly three years ago, I think, with launching your first ESG style fund, and that was more with accredited investors. Uh, and then you went on to launching Impact Agora, and here you are today with us. Uh, very much leading from the front uh, in the UK on championing, um, you know, taking impact investing to a wider audience. So it'll be interesting to hear how that journey has taken place and how have your conversations with your um, H and I clients and family offices evolved over the years in terms of their investment lens. Absolutely. So uh, I started the journey probably about eight years ago, and it took a couple of years, in fact, to get the buy-in to actually start working on this. Um, and really, we started in about 2015, actually, with some research uh, that we did originally with retail investors. And one of the most interesting things was uh, research that we did to look at interest versus activity and the, what we called this sort of intentionality gap. So the, the idea that a lot of people were interested, but not many people were active. We actually did the research again in 2017 with that UK government group, uh, whereas in, in 2015, we found 9% of people had invested um, in impact, we had, it had gone up to 15% by 2017. So this is still three years ago. And I think we will, will have seen it increase considerably since that point in time. But the more interesting thing that we found, I think, from that research was the fact that when it came to differing de demographics, under 30s um, at the time had the highest level of awareness around the topic. So awareness, always a precursor to actually doing something. I think Tom will be able to talk about this as well. You know, 57% of them had an understanding or an awareness of impact investing, whereas over 60s, 8%. So you can see that gap between sort of the awareness and just the awareness of this as a possibility of investing, as well as a legacy around how people used to invest. And I think that's a really interesting thing when we talk about, you know, a younger generation who may not have invested very much as, as much versus an older generation who do tend to be the ones who are wealthier and have investments already. And therefore, it's a very interesting conversation to have. If you're having a conversation with a family, oftentimes they have an existing portfolio, sometimes five, 10, 50, 100 million, you know, half a billion pounds, they are already invested. And therefore, for them, starting that conversation always has to be in the context of what do we have today? What are the implications of what we have today, both on the outcomes it generates on the world, as well as the investment performance that we're getting from it or would like to get from it? And therefore, how do we move that forward? And so when we look at it, the intentions and the rationale for it tends to be oftentimes a mixture of personal motivations. They have something that they are very passionate about in the world or the financial ones are becoming more and more prevalent when we have those conversations with clients. 
But in an earlier stage, people are younger, and I'll leave Tom to talk about this because it's his demographic, it's not as much as that starting point of that conversation. And so if I go back, one of the most interesting things that we found from the investing for global impact research that I mentioned before, the report that we just came out with, um, well, sorry, let me just explain. It's about 300 people, uh, very large net worth families. Um, and we asked them, where do they see the market being at? And about half of them said it was about growing steadily. A quarter of them, a little, little bit less than a quarter of them said that it was still in its infancy, right? So these are people that are already engaged, active in the market, and they still think that impact investing, sustainable investing is still in its infancy. And another quarter of them roughly said, well, we think it's about to take off. Um, and so it's really interesting to see that, that I think even for the amount of visibility and activity and effort that we see and actually hear about today marketing wise, that for many investors, they're still at the earlier stage of actually being involved in the market, even for the high net worth individuals. And there's some great examples of some very large families and our clients who are active and people who are coming and saying, I want to get active. But the reality is it's still at an early stage, I think, for, for many institutions. I mean, that's a very, I mean, I want to come back to you on why is it still at an early stage? You know, for those of us in the industry, we feel we've been talking about it for 10 years. And I know I've been talking about it for 10 years or more, and we've been championing this stuff. So there is this huge time lag between you start a new trend, a new concept, trying to convince people and then onboarding them. But before we come to that in a little bit more detail, I want to draw Tom in here to take up from where you left in terms of, you know, how, how are your investors viewing this? Is it at early stage, takeoff stage? You know, how, what's your experience been, Tom? Yeah, I think, um, I think as Damien alluded to, I think our demographic, the people that are using our, our app, don't really have any preconceived ideas of what uh, general investing is in the first place. So we have, you know, 90% of the people using our app have never invested before. So they don't have any previous wiring about what, it, what other kind of investing looks like. They've only started and want to do it this way. So this is the default option for them. And they don't, we don't have to really do any convincing that this is the future or this is the way it should be done. They're coming to us with that already kind of solidified as a mindset. Um, so we don't have any problems attracting people and we don't have any arguments about returns, about um, whether you should have this kind of impact or that kind of impact. It's almost like a completely blank slate. And in that sense, it's much easier for us to talk to and to attract our generation because they don't have those pre-existing ideas of what other sure. investing is. Um, so we we have an ability to kind of grow from fresh, talk from fresh to our to our to our customers um, because they they, they don't they, they, they don't come at it from a point of view of going yeah but do I have to give up returns to do it this way or or, or anything like that. An interesting point as well is what we the, the the need that we serve we serve two needs really is to it, it, the first is primarily I think. To, uh, we serve the need of people providing for their own future and their own family's futures because in the UK and Europe, there isn't really, really any investment culture like there perhaps is in India or the US. So we are serving that need of making people feel comfortable doing something for the first time. And I think one of the main factors that makes them feel comfortable is this feel good element to it, is that they can kind of tell their friends about where the money's going and they feel an emotional connection to it in a way that they didn't ever feel thinking about other types of investment because we're not the first company to come along and offer an easy way to invest in the UK. But I think we're, we're the first or one of the first to come along in Europe that connects it with people's values. And I think that that will be the thing that gets most people of our generation over the line to start investing. Um, I think it's easier for us to have an impact conversation. It's harder for us to have the investing conversation, but with impact, it makes it much easier. It's interesting you say, so people are Oh, sorry. I think my uh, my line cut out. Just now. Is it mine or yours? Actually, not. Sorry, sorry. Anurana, did you I think we did you lost you for a little bit? If you okay. Can. So, Tom, I said it's interesting that you don't have to deal with the issue of a trade-off between financial return or not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's also helped that the financial returns of our portfolios have been better than the the general stock market as well. Um, but I think now during the past eight months. That conversation, even if it was there a little bit, has completely died away. We don't have to have that conversation anymore at all. Um, and we only tend to have to have it when we're speaking with journalists or we're speaking with people from a different demographic that don't really use our product and don't really know what it is. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's not it's not a hindrance to, to us growing the number of customers on the platform. In fact, 
it's just a bonus because it, it, our, our DNA, our brand, our user experience, the investing style is one thing. I think it's a cut through for us in terms of messaging um, and it helps us out much more than it hinders us, I think. Fantastic. It, it gives us all a lot of reason for hope, to be honest, uh, Tom. Thank you. Ramesh, I want to draw you in here and then bring Damien in as well. Uh, for you, Ramesh, to share your experience with Baitri as India's first online marketplace for impact investing. Uh, and, and Damien, circling back to you on this time lag between you know, having, having a concept and a desire and raising awareness and advocacy to, to you know, how long does it actually take for things to happen? Um, and, um, you know, any, any guidance for the private sector players out there who want to do more of this? Ramesh, let's start with Betri. Uh, you know, you, you, you've had the benefit of a slightly longer runway uh, than Damien has had with, um, with Impact Agora. So let's start with, with you, Dave, uh, Ramesh. Yeah. So, so uh, Betri uh, has been a unique concept in India in the sense that uh, I think uh, it is the first and possibly the only uh, dedicated uh, marketplace for impact investing in India today. Uh, so, so, so for, to that extent, it's I guess it's been a it's been a learning experience for all of us who who, who conceptualized it, who thought it up, and who are implementing it, and then who are constantly uh, you know uh, evolving with the platform. Uh, so, much as we uh, much as has happened in the rest of the world, I think uh, uh, while initially we thought that we should be able to get a lot of uh, HNIs and other individuals on the platform, um, it was the institutions who, who, who led the, the initial uh, wave of investing on the platform. So, so we have a whole lot of institutions on the platform. Uh, uh, in a sense, you know, there wasn't much of uh, selling to do in a, in a manner of speaking to the institutions. They were pretty much aware of impact investing. They were largely uh, very well-informed investors. And they saw the platform as, as, a, as, a, as an ap absolutely brilliant way of accessing uh, deals which were otherwise under the radar. Uh, so, so Baitri brought a number of new deals to them, from, from, uh, especially from, again, from tier two, tier three cities of India, deals which are not easy to access. Same time, obviously, provided a window for these entrepreneurs uh, to be able to reach impact investors who, in most of the cases, they never heard of. Forget about actually having uh, talked to them or met them. They, were, they had not even heard of some of these investors, even, in, even Indian investors, not just investors from overseas. Um, so, so in that sense, it is, it's been a good bridge. It's been a, it's, it's been a, a successful connecting platform. Uh, over the last, or in the recent past, we've also seen a lot of family offices and individuals coming on, uh, coming on to the platform through Baytree, a lot of them waiting in the wings. Uh, I would like to dwell on this in two parts. One is the larger investors, the family offices and the ultra high net worth investors and so on. Uh, in India, it's, it's important to note that it's, a, it's by and large a return sensitive market. So even if there is an investor who is quite committed and who does want to invest in impact, uh, one has to establish a case that uh, the returns from impact and the returns from this kind of investment are are going to be you know somewhat in the same ballpark as as non impact or general investment so to speak so that's something which which we've had to work on that's something we've had to establish and uh, therefore this is a market which works not just on the social consciousness and 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 the uh, intention to do impact but also to some extent, or it's, it's, it's a relatively return sensitive market. Uh, however, having said this, uh, we are seeing a much greater level of awareness in the younger generation. And, and the, these are the people who are often drivers, even in the family offices and in the, in the families of high net worth individuals. So, so we do see that the, the daughters and the sons and the younger generation uh, in these families, they are the ones who are re relatively leading the push towards impact investment. And as, as Damien and Tom both pointed out, the, these, these investors usually don't have legacy ideas. They don't come with baggage. They don't come with any preconceived baggage about investing, So, which does help. On the other hand, they also question the status quo. There is a gap between intention and ability, which we are hoping to bridge through to Baytree, in a sense, providing access to deals. Uh, and uh, But of course, keeping in view the relative financial sensitivity or the return sensitivity of the market, Therefore, so that, that's an important aspect of the deals we bring to market to see that these are really no different from uh, what I would call a non-impact deal. But at the same time, these are companies, individuals, or entrepreneurs who are making a difference. That, that's the point we're really trying to bring to the market. 
So that is, thank you, Ramesh. That is, you know, talking to the impact investing community, which is maintained for some time now, and we now have data and evidence to show that you don't have to compromise financial returns to achieve impact. Um, and I think it just, in, in slight, I mean, I, I can understand in some of the emerging markets, people are more uh, sensitive towards financial returns, but there is more advocacy to be done there. Damien, circling back to you on, on your experience, early experience in the last five months since you've launched um, Impact Agora and what the uptake has been with, even within the institutional investors. Yeah, so if we look backwards to, uh, to Impact Agora, so that initiative we launched to bring together the intermediaries. So again, this is the range of people who are already involved in Impact because they're Impact Accelerators, they are family offices, they are other fund managers, there are other banks as well. And really the idea was to be able to help to address some of the things that Ramesh was also talking about in terms of finding or accessing higher quality deal flow or the capital on the other side. One of the things that we constantly hear about as everybody does is I can't find any capital or I can't find any investors. And to some extent, quite honestly, got a bit tired of hearing both sides point the finger the other way and said, well, let's think about trying to do something about it. Um, so with that in mind, what we did was we set up Impact Agora as a, as a community of intermediaries to be able to share these deals yeah. um, and be able to highlight both the fund managers, but also some of the individual companies that are coming forward or being sponsored. So it's not an individual entrepreneur who can access it, but actually the a sponsor or sponsoring organization. It could be a family. It could be yourselves, you know, Baytree involved in that as well. So being able to highlight where, where some credibility, the higher quality comes from is because somebody's already involved in it. And the response has actually been really impressive in some ways because you know, as these things go, you set up a, the party and you don't know if people are gonna join. Um, we've had actually over 70 organizations join uh, in the last few months um, across the globe, really. We really started, to, the idea was to focus on the UK because it's home market for us and obviously you know, a very robust and, and active ecosystem. But we've had this really wide range of organizations, as I was alluding to, join because they can see this has value to be able to share and address one of the big problems that, that, that Ramesh has, has mentioned as well in terms of that finding higher quality deal flow. It is focused on the private markets. I will say that and that makes it a bit different from what Tom is doing in, in many respects. But the idea fundamentally is how do we overcome some of the structural issues and opaqueness in the market? Definitely one of them as well as the visibility and quite honestly, because we don't have quite as many conferences to go off and meet everybody at anymore, uh, being able to help find ways for people to share and introduce yeah. themselves to each other has been really important, I think, for people to find another source or another outlet or a way to go about doing that. And in your experience, have you struggled in, in this current environment with due diligence, which has been such a big thing for people not being able to conduct due diligence and to what extent has technology played a role in this? Yeah, so it's interesting. Initially, everybody said, no, 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 we're continuing on. I've actually started to see a bit of a slowdown. So I think a lot of the deal flow that happened during the first few months yeah. was th were things that were already in progress. So I think yeah. there's the origination and sourcing issue, but then you're right, the due diligence side of things has definitely, it feels like it's extending out as people do still feel like they want to, we're not quite at the stage where we can look at somebody across the Zoom call and be comfortable yeah. about it. There's something still, I think, for everybody that they want to generally see each other, especially on a private markets deal, um, yeah. where, the, where the requirement of being able to see somebody in a context, you know, break bread with them, et cetera, makes a big difference to being confident about moving forward. I think we will probably be able to see people say, look, I need to make these decisions and I'll do it in the best set of information I have, as we always do. Yeah. So I think that will start to shift over time as well. But at the moment, there was the initial things carried on, and then obviously something just stopped. Yeah. But most of the deal flow that was already in progress continued. I think it slowed back down. It'll be interesting to see as we continue on if that's if that shifts as well. So a conversation in slower time again. You know, how can you how can technology um, aid um, some of these um, genuinely technical issues involved in in investing? Tom, circling back to you, uh, it'll be great to hear a little bit about your experience with the regulator in the UK in launching Ticker. Um, this is quite an important one, particularly in the emerging markets where customers are often not that uh, educated about some of the pitfalls of, of retail investing. I mean, Ramesh may actually uh, not necessarily agree with me, but uh, even so, we'd like to hear your perspective with the FCA in particular and what challenges, if any, or what opportunities the FCA provided you in launching Ticker? Yeah, so initially, 
obviously the, with the product that we developed in order to even test the concept and have one person use it, we needed to be regulated in some way. So there's a yeah. big barrier for all of products that are like this. It's not like selling cakes at a cake store. We can just go and sell cakes straight away. We had to go and get regulated. Um, but in the UK, there's, um, there's an element of the regulation where you can become what is called an appointed representative of another company with, an, with a license already. So you effectively rent a regulatory license yeah. from someone. And that renting process for in order to get up and running takes about four weeks versus the eight to 12 months in, in getting the full regulatory license. So, the, so it benefited us greatly that we could go and get this license, uh, a rental license effectively, and still still abide by all the regulation and laws that we needed to abide by as operating. Um, but it meant we can test the, uh, the, test the app, test the product much, much quicker. And then eventually, when we were a little bit bigger, it made sense to then go and get our full kind of uh, application process done. Um, and it, despite it taking a long time, probably took six, eight, maybe 10 months in the end to get, to get fully regulated, that's the kind of that's the kind of going time frame for most people to get fully regulated. And the FCA were very very pragmatic with us, um, and they were very very understanding that we are not a huge financial institution. We don't have everything in place that a huge financial institution uh, should have. And they have kind of a regime where they where they allow startups, you know, within the realm of uh, acceptability to kind of. Um, speed up through the process of being regulated so they can test the concept much quicker. And there's more of a focus from the FCA on um, promoting innovation in financial services um, the, than there was perhaps years ago. Yeah. So they were very, very pragmatic with us, very understanding and very quick. And they were very keen to get us regulated and operating because they understood that, and they understand that they have these, they have these FCA sandboxes and innovation centers where they are taking in new companies with new business models and accelerating them through the regulatory process which is resulting in um, a financial services sector in the UK that's constantly innovating and constantly changing. And that's probably, you know, why it's one of the best, best financial services centers in the world. So overall, it was, it was very quick for us to get up and running, renting a license, and then pretty straightforward, albeit with a caveat that it's hard anyway to get a regulatory license, but they made it a little bit easier because they are promoting innovation within the sector. Um, so my experience with the FCA so far has been a very, very positive one, um, and they've been very helpful to us. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. I wish we could continue the conversation between the panelists, but looking at the clock, I think it would be only fair to open it up to our, our audience um, to, to pose their questions to the panelists. Um, may I suggest if you would like to ask a question that you unmute yourself and you ask the question out in an open forum and, and let you know a short introduction to yourself, just name which organization and who is your question addressed to. No questions? Yeah, I think Anuradha, there were questions on the chat and I think they've been taken care of. Uh, I'll request everyone to continue posting your questions there and you can continue with the conversation. Okay, in, if, if we have some time and if there aren't any further questions coming, then perhaps um, I'll, I'll invite you, Ramesh, a little bit to reflect on the regulatory aspect from an emerging market perspective in taking impact investing retail. Sure. Uh, so, the, so in a little bit of contrast to what Tom said about the regulatory environment, and I guess that also reflects uh, more on the state of the capital markets in, in, a, in a more mature market like the UK as compared to India. Uh, here, uh, the regulator, where, when it comes to retail in, in the capital markets, whether it's, it's direct equities or impact investing, uh, the focus of the regulator oftentimes tends to be much more on investor protection than on anything else. Uh, the market has, has witnessed over the years, uh, uh, let's say, uh, not so conducive uh, conditions for retail investors in terms of mis-selling and in terms of other malpractices and so on. Uh, though though, though I, I would say that uh, we, we've kept pace with the times and a lot of that have got ironed out over time and so on. But, but notwithstanding all of that, given that we have huge numbers, we have a lot of investors coming from all over the country, uh, levels of uh, financial sophistication, levels of education, awareness, and all of which vary dramatically. Uh, there is there 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 is and there will continue to be increasing emphasis on uh, investor protection, which is where I think uh, 
platforms uh, uh, and companies like Baytree have, have a major role to play because we intermediate in a very positive way. We, on the one side, we, we bring to the regulator uh, a solid, uh, uh, I would say, an institutional framework, uh, bringing the, uh, bridging the bringing, or rather bridging the individual investor uh, to, to, the, uh, uh, to the impact enterprise. Uh, so, so that's I think I think that's a role which which uh, institutions like Baytree can play in a, in a very effective manner. Uh, but there are a couple of uh, other areas which I would like to highlight, which which hopefully will receive uh, uh, some attention from the regulators in India uh, in the near future. Uh, one is one is uh, you know the uh, uh, what I would call the uh, the eligibility limits for for uh, retail investors to participate in the alternative investments market. Uh, alternative investment funds in India uh, require a minimum investment uh, uh, or require a minimum commitment of rupees 10 million, which is about 150,000 uh, US dollars uh, for, for individual investors, which is of course a fairly high barrier. Uh, this is again coming from the same uh, context of, of uh, letting in by and large more qualified and more aware uh, retail investors into the market. This is obviously a, a, a fairly large threshold, a very large threshold when it comes to impact investing and early stage investing in India. And therefore, one has to look at innovative ways around it, for instance, pooling mechanisms, uh, which can permit smaller investors with, with smaller ticket sizes uh, to, to join larger investors in, in, in deals. So, so, you know, so therefore, you don't have a very large threshold. You can come in with, let's say, a, a $1,000 ticket size or something like that. But, but from a from an investor protection measure, you you join a larger investor or you join an institutional investor, so that there is a certain base element of diligence and a base element of curation of deals which has been done. Uh, so so that's one area where where uh, better pooling mechanisms have to evolve, uh, so that so that mass participation, so that retail participation in the impact market is in, is enabled more easily. Uh, that's something which which a lot of us, including Baytree, are working on. And, and hopefully that's something which will receive regulatory attention. Uh, the second area is, is what is called the CSR uh, framework in India, Corporate Social Responsibility Framework in India. Quite unusually, uh, in the sense unusually I say, because it's, it's not common in many other countries, uh, there is a regulatory obligation under the Companies uh, Act in India uh, for uh, all, all companies, in fact, not just listed companies, all public companies uh, to invest uh, or to rather uh, contribute a, a percentage of their profits after tax, typically around 2% of that, uh, to, to what is called corporate social responsibility. CSR is, is fairly tightly defined in terms of, you know, what qualifies as CSR and what does not. And today, uh, all of CSR, all of the qualified uh, contributions in CSR are in the nature of contributions or donations or grants and not investments. Uh, so so the, the law does not permit uh, any part of CSR to be really uh, uh, an investment. It's, it's got to be a grant or a donation. Uh, if, if this were to change over time, and that's something which is, again, we believe receiving regulatory attention, if investments, particularly in, in select impact areas, uh, can be brought under the ambit of CSR, uh, these provide, uh, this is a very large uh, area of opportunity to, to grow impact investments. So companies could actually take the lead in, in uh, seeding an impact investment. And with, if you have a pooling mechanism at the back of it, that enables retail investors and others to actually come into such investments. So hopefully, uh, you know, there will be uh, some amendment, some, some uh, evolution in the CSR mechanism, which will allow investments in impact areas to actually uh, happen through this. Great. Thank you for that, Ramesh. Um, I'm going to give the audience another opportunity in case somebody wants to raise a question. Otherwise, we'll carry on. OK. Jamin, I would, you know, before we wrap up today's session, I would really love to hear your perspective first and then Tom's perspective on how do you see this business growing for your respective organizations? You know, what's next uh, for you in Barclays, Damien, and, and for ticker scaling up, Tom? So within Barclays, I think it's a continuation of the effort and the journey really that we've been on for quite a long time. I think the, the external environment because of greater awareness and interest and visibility around the topics we're talking about makes it a lot easier. But it's still a journey um, in terms of being able to change and integrate how the organization works, um, to be really honest with you. 
And so as we've been working with the different uh, product teams or the different advisors, there is still a range of people who believe in this and are very excited about it. And those are the people that are still skeptical of it. And I think what happens over time is we continue on that. We continue to demonstrate, as Tom said, that you are getting outperformance. We continue to see more clients who are demanding it from us and therefore pushing us forward. And in some ways, I think, uh, you know, I'd expect that, you know, the conversation we have, or I'd hope certainly the conversation we've had with a bit of the acceleration that we've seen yeah. is one that is less around the what and more around the how and how well do you do things, not just do yeah. you do it. I think every day, everybody today talks about they're doing this. I don't think we've gotten to the stage where we are actually saying, well, these people do it better than, than other people. And I think that's definitely will be a, a phase that we go through as well as quite honestly, all the marketing hype that, uh, that disappears after some point in time or the, the disillusionment that will come from some people as things are not nearly as well as they promised in, in many respects. But eventually, you know, in my mind, what I think where we're headed is one in which, you know, I look back at it in, you know, 1952, Markowitz writes, the, writes a paper about risk. Prior to that, we only talked about return on investments. It was never a risk adjusted return. We are still debating how to incorporate risk effectively into markets, and that's the best way to do it. You know, the idea that we talked about or coined the phrase impact investing, you know, 10 years ago at that Rockefeller meeting is still very, very early days. But I think eventually this becomes just another component piece of how we invest. And I think the demand is there, you know, again, growing. I think the capabilities are growing, and that's also where we see regulators and governments and data providers being able to support it. But I think we get to eventually a stage where this is no longer a conversation of, you know, do you do it, but why do you not do it? And moreover, how well do you do it? And who does it better than someone else? Um, but going back to it, realistically, that's not something that's going to happen in the next 12 or 18 months. I'd love it for it to be happening, but over the next five or 10 years still. And there's still a lot to do, a lot that we can do in that interim period of time. Yes, totally agree with you, Damien. Still very, very early days, a decade on, uh, you know, we are talking of impact investing today, not just as another asset class, but about all, all investing, really incorporating impact uh, as a lens when investing alongside financial uh, or environmental uh, uh, lens as we do today. There is a, a, a question there for you, Damien, is Barclays yeah. working with other banks um, to help them move towards impact investing? So, you know, a feather in your cap there with obvious leadership status. <laughs> So we, uh, so we do actually, so they, there is a, you know, even, even at competitor organizations, we all kind of know each other and, and are all trying to get in the same direction. So I think for a lot of the individuals, definitely, but even more so, I think there's two things. One is uh, banks working with each other to help build out and, and, and move this forward so that we're doing it collectively and other financial institutions, fund managers, you know, data providers, all of us have a real incentive to try to collaborate more effectively to build the market in the first place, which is why Impact Agora, you know, we're welcoming people from other institutions on there. Um, but even beyond that, I, again, we go back to it, as Tom said, you know, the FCA in the UK, right, the, they have a green sandbox, we were a part of the green sandbox that they, they were working on. Um, regulators are, are trying to do it. That's where the UK National Advisory Board and that advisory group to UK government, both reports, if you are, uh, they're, they're old now, actually, it's a few years on, both really still relevant for people if they are interested in thinking about how do they move their particular country forward around the topic. And obviously the Global Steering Group, which Cliff is, I think, talking, or I expect he's talking later on today. Um, so I think it's not just financial services institutions that we're collaborating with, but actually more generally the industry. And that's also where global initiatives like the Impact Management Project come in. You know, lots of people trying to help move this forward. Everybody has different views sometimes around the topic, but at least collectively, it's really interesting to see what is generally a very competitive industry actually yeah. try to collaborate around the topic. That is so true. Tom, moving on to you, if you would like to, you know, share your, you know, what, what's your vision for Ticker going forward and perhaps any concluding remarks uh, that you might have for us? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think we see our role in the kind of impact ecosystem uh, as driving, you know, a high number of individuals to do this for the first time. Um, so I think we're uh, not far from 100,000 customers so far, but that's not going to really do it. So for us in the next, in three years, we want to be at around three to four million customers. Um, that means by the end of the next year, we need to be at 300,000. By the end of 2022, we need to be at a million. So we need to acquire a high number of individuals 
in order to do that, um, we need to have a product that's better. So we need to invest heavily in product, which means yeah. investing heavily in engineering talent. Um, in order to do that, we need to hire more people, which means we need to raise money to do that because we won't be profitable for about another 18 to 24 months, something like that. So it's all those things really. So raising money, building the team, improving the engineering team, improving the product, and then scaling to that, that number of users around Europe before taking it internationally. So we want to be the first truly scaled kind of investment app outside of really the US, outside of outside of trading apps, it's outside of the US. And we want to do it all through impact. Um, and we, we haven't got a great deal of time to get it done. So uh, we're heavily, heavily focused on acquisition and product. Um, and I think if we can do that and we can convince, you know, four or five million people in the next three or four years that this is the way to do it, I think we can set off a ripple effect. And I think this way of investing then in 10 years time, hopefully less, will be just seen as the default way of investing for absolutely everybody. Um, and impact investing as a term will just move to be called investing. That's my kind of hope for the future. That's exactly the kind of vision we want to hear. And, and good luck to you, Tom, and your team. And of course, um, all of us here uh, at Sankal, Barclays, Impact Agora, Baytree, all of us are here to, to help in any way we can. Good luck. Ramesh, any concluding remarks from you before we wrap up? Uh, and then I'll circle back uh, and give Damien a couple of minutes as well. So, yeah, uh, so uh, I think, I think uh, having, having uh, heard all these exciting views, uh, I am more and more convinced that uh, the next wave in India will certainly have a fair level of retail participation. The next wave of impact investing in India will certainly have a fair level of retail participation. Uh, and as it has happened in the equity markets and in, in so many other markets, uh, in the payment markets, for instance, uh, I think I think we will leapfrog a generation and, and we will have a lot of retail investors coming in over the next few years uh, alongside families and alongside institutions. Uh, so, so the challenge for us, for, for those of us who have been uh, the early uh, uh, participants in the industry, the challenge for us is to ensure that we have the right kind of products for this audience. Uh, we have the right technology, the right platforms, and, and most important, you know, that uh, we work with the regulators in evolving the right regulatory framework. So I think a lot of our time and attention is really going to be focused on this. Uh, I think we will have the investors. It is, it is uh, the ball is going to be in our court but to ensure that we provide them with the means to invest, we provide them with the mechanisms to invest. And I think that, that's, that's the role which, which increasingly we hope to play through Baytree as well. Thank you, Ramesh. So you're basically saying entrepreneurs need to continue to work very, very hard at this and, you know, continue with the innovation and work with the regulators to make it feasible for the investors who are sitting at, at the fringes, as it were, uh, waiting to participate in this. Damien, any last comments from you? Uh, I think for those, you know, if, if you are on the uh, watching and you are sitting within a large financial institution in your, in your country or whatever else, I think it's also possible within those organizations too. It's a different challenge, definitely. Um, in some ways, a difficult one, you know, quite honestly, oftentimes organizations that get large are set up to continue to do what they do and do it very well, as opposed to do new things. And really, to some extent, what we're all talking about is doing something new and different in a way that hasn't been done in the past. So in that sense, the, the, the advice or the thoughts that I would share is one of two things. One, either it becomes something top down. So from a senior, senior level, there's a buy-in and a push to do it. And I think that definitely is more evident and available today than it was five or 10 years ago when we started in many respects, because a lot of the senior executives are thinking about legacy, are thinking about role they do wanna play, are using COVID and other instances to think about sort of what role does that institution play. But moreover on a bottom up perspective, and that's certainly where those of us who started earlier have come in and making sure that what you're doing is linking very clearly to commercial opportunities for your organization and being really clear about that, things that you already do well. So I know you mentioned that, that fund that we launched a number of years ago, that fund of funds, we, we do really good manager and fund selection. So building on that was a great way to get going before we started doing some of the structured products or some of the other things. So really picking out those small pieces of what it is that you want to do um, and building it into your organization and having the commitment and the drive to, make, to keep it going is one of the critical things. And then beyond that, as Ramar said, I think there is a wider view in industry um, in many places that government has a role to play, regulators have a role to play, and they all want to, but trying to help convene that, I think helps to move things forward. And I think that's where the UK particularly has been fortunate to have 
big society capital to have these initiatives, to have the FCA step in, et cetera. And it's very easy to think about doing that um, in a number of countries, you know, uh, uh, around the world. And obviously a lot of the sound help, you know, countries that are, are really a focus, but it does take people to sort of take that first step and push it forward. So if you're uncertain, I think oftentimes getting going somewhere is the most important thing as opposed to having anything truly in place. Great, thank you for that. Damien, Ramesh and Tom, thank you so much for joining this session at Sankalp. I hope our audience found the session uh, as useful as I did. Lots of, lots of exciting agendas being set there. We hope to reconvene again next November in person uh, and uh, take stock of where each of us has uh, got to. Thank you Sankalp team and for making this happen um, and enjoy the rest of your days wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Bye-bye.